A dismal performance from business taxes in April could reshape New Hampshire's budget for the next two years. Key differences still remain between House and Senate pension packages and an effort to finally end the JUA raid once and for all, coming up this week in the Cloakroom. The Cloakroom, a weekly video magazine of the Josiah Bartlett Center for Public Policy. This week, we track a major public pension reform package that clears the New Hampshire House. A plan to return a $110 million surplus to the Joint Underwriting Association policyholders and the results of our New Hampshire watchdog poll on prison outsourcing. But first, underperforming business taxes could reshape New Hampshire's budget for the next two years. This week, the Department of Revenue Administration reported that April tax revenues fell nearly $30 million short of expectations, widening the budget gap facing the legislature and reigniting a political fight over how fast New Hampshire's economy will grow. Governor John Lynch's budget counts on revenues coming in according to plan this year and growing by between 3 and 4 percent over the next two. House budget writers expect to start the year with a $50 million deficit and think revenues will be virtually flat through 2013. That's created a $300 million budget battle based on revenues. Following the gloomy April showers, the House Ways and Means Committee has downgraded its already pessimistic forecast and is asking Senate budgeteers to do the same. We spoke with House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Steve Stepanek and former Chair Susan Almey, the ranking Democrat on the panel. Uh, well, Grant, as we looked at the uh, numbers and as we promised when we started this whole process that we would come back and take a look at revenues again in, uh, in April once we had more definitive information, obviously everybody hoped that we would have more positive information that we would be able to potentially raise the revenue estimates. Unfortunately, ways and means in, in April was probably a little bit overwhelming optimistic uh, back in January when we originally did the numbers. What we're looking at now is we went through the numbers, we brought all the agencies back in last week, we reviewed everything, for the most part, most of the agencies came back and said, you know, we were overly optimistic, we, we agree with your numbers, most of the agencies reduced their numbers down to ways and means numbers. In the case of the business taxes, uh, in particular, there were, were three major areas that, that we had issues with uh, because of the numbers. One was the business taxes and the IND taxes. Uh, and, and unfortunately, based upon, and we actually used DRA's numbers as we moved forward. We looked at the business taxes and how far they were down in the uh, interest and dividends taxes and how far they were down. And, and based upon all the information we had, we had to reduce the number for the balance of the year. So instead of showing, which we originally did a $53 million deficit, we ended up increasing that by $14.4 million. Well, I don't think we're very far apart at all in the long term. My group and the committee as a whole on this year, though we may be able to upgrade them again. And maybe there are some very tricky things going on that we don't understand in the business taxes. The corporate business taxes came in last month, they came in 6.6% above uh, plan. The plan apparently was artificially increased this month, but we won't know for sure what that means until May. Uh, we might be able to upgrade it, maybe we might not. Uh, but where we differ extremely from the Republicans on this is that their growth estimates essentially say that we are not going to grow as a state over the next two years. Also this week, the New Hampshire House overwhelmingly approved Senate Bill 2, a package of changes to the New Hampshire retirement system designed to head off a $4 billion shortfall in the state's pension liability. The Senate has already passed its version, but key differences remain. We spoke with Ken Hawkins, who chairs the House Special Committee on Retirement, about how he plans to iron out the differences with the Senate. The basic differences are uh, we're increasing the age of group one over a period of time to 65 from 60. Group one is teachers and teachers public employees, and municipal and employees. State workers, municipal employees. Uh, group two, police and fire. Uh, we now have a 55 age retirement with 25 years of service. 
Um, the Senate still has an 850. Um, we in the House, changes will affect everybody, vested and non-vested. The Senate version is only for vested employees. Uh, those are the main things. Uh, we also define part-time work, uh, a maximum of 1,300 hours a year. Uh, we also... And that's aimed at double dipping. Somebody it's, it's retires the and goes to work 35 hours a week. 39 and a half in Brookline, 37 and a half in some of the other smaller communities. Uh, basically, those are full-time jobs. Uh, the system does not get any contributions in, even from the employee or the employer. And 75% of the money in the retirement system comes from earnings on investments. If we don't have anything coming in to invest, we can't meet the pension requirements 20, 30 years down the road. The unions are opposed to both packages. They say that you're going to have mass retirements, people are going to get out of the system before these changes can be implemented. We have uh, amended this morning in the House the effective date of uh, our version of SB3 from July 1st to December 1st. We have heard you know, all the background noise about people rushing to retire because they don't know what it's going to be. We also know the retirement system cannot implement the software changes. It's going to take them four to six months to implement the software changes for the changes in the earned compensation, et cetera, et cetera. So we recognize that fact and in order to help quiet the background noise, we've changed the effect of the December. And where does it go from here? Is it just waiting for the conference committee? Right now, yes. I just let Senator Bradley know that we have finished it. As soon as they get it across the hall in the Senate, they will vote to non-concur and uh, request a committee of conference. As soon as they do that, it will come back to the House side today. We will see to that, and hopefully Monday at 1 o'clock, we will start the committee of conference. What's your timeline for the committee of conference to get its work done? In my opinion, I would like to be done by the 15th to 20th of May. We have the budget committee of conference. We have all we're going to have probably 40 or 50 committee of conferences. If we can get this big one out of the way, we have a number of people that are on this committee of conference, both the Senate and the House, that are going to be on numerous other study committees. The problem we're going to have in the next 10 to 15 days is figuring out what days people are available because we still have committee meetings, we still have session days, that type of stuff. But that's my goal. Have you heard from the governor's office? Do you expect uh, a I signature on this bill? I have not spoken to the governor. Okay. I don't know that anyone from the House has. Uh, I assume that Senator Bradley has. I don't know. The vote in here was pretty close to no crime. Two years ago, Governor John Lent tried to balance the budget with $110 million in surplus from the Joint Underwriting Association, or JUA a medical malpractice account set up by the state to help doctors and hospitals get affordable liability insurance. The state Supreme Court ruled that the JUA is not a state agency and the surplus is not state money. Lynch then tried to change administrative rules to give Insurance Commissioner Roger Savini broad authority to transfer the JUA surplus to state coffers. But the lame duck Democratic legislature stymied that bid in December. This year, lawmakers critical of the JUA raids are backing a bill to distribute the disputed surplus to JUA policyholders, removing the temptation to take the money. Attorney Scott O'Connell of Nixon Peabody represents the policyholders, and he's backing the bill. It's a great bill. It's a strong bill. It provides a holistic solution to this nagging problem that's been going on for two years. It provides to the people who paid every dime into the, uh, the surplus money back to them. Uh, and it also provides for a study commission that will look at the future of the JUA and how it can remain strong and vibrant and participate in the market. Because right now, the medical malpractice market continues to have challenges, and we need the JUA. But at the same time, it's got a surplus. And the policyholders who funded every dime of that surplus have been judged entitled to that money, and it should be returned to them. Lynch and Savini argue that since the JUA is no longer a state agency, the surplus it accumulated over the years is no longer tax-free, and that the IRS could take it all away at any time. JUA policyholders think the fund should still be tax-exempt, but are setting aside $25 million just in case.
Well, there is an IRS issue, and there is a provision in the bill that deals with that specific issue. Uh, to the extent that the JUA is not a tax exempt organization, monies have been set aside to satisfy any federal obligation. We think actually a good story exists to tell the IRS that it is still a tax exempt organization. That from the very beginning, when the IRS approved this exemption, uh, the regulations provided for the return of funds to policyholders. So we think that's an important message to the IRS. But in the event that it is taxable. There's $25 million set aside to satisfy that obligation. We're working with the International Accounting Firm Waterhouse Coopers, people who worked in the exempt organizations division at the IRS, and they tell us that that $25 million is more than enough to satisfy the obligation. So it's a good bill, it solves this problem, it covers all these contingencies, and it gets this private money back in the hands of the people who funded it. It should pass, and we hope it does. Thank you. Finally this week, the results of our New Hampshire watchdog poll. The legislature is considering moving several hundred inmates to out-of-state prisons in order to save money by shutting down some prison beds in Concord. We asked what you think, and by a two-to-one margin, you want to keep New Hampshire's prisoners close to home. This week, we ask you about revenues. Who's right, the pessimistic House budget writers or the optimistic Governor John Lynch? Be sure to vote at NewHampshireWatchdog.org and we'll bring you the results next week right here in the Cloakroom. I'm Grant Lossie from the Josiah Bartlett Center for Public Policy. Thanks for watching.